Welcome back. So in this lecture, we're going to continue to discuss our modeling of soil moisture. We're going to continue to be thinking about a, a one-dimensional uh, profile through the soil. And in the last video, we talked about uh, Darcy's law, this flux equation that says the flux of uh, moisture through a soil depends on its conductivity and the vertical gradient in water potential. We learned about what water potential is in terms of a gravitational component and a matrix component, as well as potentially a pressure and osmotic component. Uh, so we have equations for both those components, a gravitational and a matrix component that vary as a function of soil moisture. We also learned that this uh, soil conductivity varies as a function of soil moisture. So now we have these three equations that we would need uh, to model uh, soil moisture, but how would we actually do that. So let's talk through uh, the things you'd have to think about to actually implement that. So let's start with something very similar to what we did when we talked through the diffusion pipe model, which is let's start by saying we have a one dimensional problem and we're going to take that overall soil column and we're going to discretize it into layers, uh, just like we did for the diffusion problem. So now this is discretized into layers. And so now it's going to be thinking about it in a computer as, as a vector where we have uh, you know, some delta z telling us about the thickness of each layer. And we have some state variables associated with that, particularly the soil moisture is the one, the theta that is what we care about. Uh, we're also going to assume that our flow is going to basically be going downhill. So our, our state variable of interest is our soil moisture. And let's say we decide to measure that as, as on a percentage basis, cubic meters of moisture per cubic meters of soil. To model this as a dynamic process, we need to set up a loop over time because moisture is going to be flowing through the soil. So it's, it's changing both in space and in time. We'd begin, need to begin by calculating the current conductivity and current uh, water potential in each grid cell, uh, because that's going to drive that flux. We could then calculate what the flux would be. So uh, that's how much uh, cubic meters of moisture are going to move per second per square meter of soil. So flux is going to end up having units of meters per second. So you can think of it as, as a velocity that the water is moving downward through the soil in some sense. But it's really more like uh, the velocity at which it, water is passing any particular reference point, you know, the rate that it's moving. Once we've done this, these pre-calculations, we would then need to set up a loop over depth and calculate the actual amount of water moved from one layer to the other. So we'd have in any particular layer, we'd have a flux coming in from above, and we'd have a flux going out. And so we'd have a net chain, a net flux. That's the difference between the two. And that uh, we'd say that the, the net change in moisture per unit time is going to be driven by that flux and some actual thickness. We can calculate and you know basically calculate an actual delta theta, so a change in soil moisture. And then we'd update that soil moisture. So we'd say soil moisture at the next time point is soil moisture right now, plus the water that's coming in from above that flux in delta x delta t from above, and the flux and then minus the flux out. So future equals present plus what's coming in minus what's going out. And we'd update the soil moisture. In a nutshell, that's what's happening in most layers most of the time. Uh, but what I want to talk through now is that uh, reality is a little bit more complicated than that. And there's a few other things we'd have to think about to actually implement this problem. And it's, it's worth kind of thinking through uh, what those issues are and how we would deal with them. So the first issue is one related essentially to conservation of mass and that uh, these discrete layers are of finite size and so they can only hold so much water. So if you think about each 
layer kind of representing a bucket, uh, it has a capacity. And so the input cannot exceed that capacity. So we would have a calculation of that delta soil moisture in. And most of the time, that would be what's coming from our flux equation. Our flux in times our delta t divided by our delta x. So that takes our flux meters per second multiplied it by second to get meters uh, overall, and then express that on terms of how much, you know, basically the delta x you know, uh, amount that has to move. Then we would say, uh, but what's this, what's, how much room is left in the bucket? So the total size of the bucket is theta sat, the saturation. And so the remaining space in the bucket is the difference between theta sat and the current theta. So the, you can't put that delta theta can't be more than the amount of space left in that bucket. And so it's the minimum of what the flux equation predicts and the, the remaining space. Uh, so, you know, if you, you could, if you have a, a, a layer that's completely saturated, you could have lots of water sitting on top of it. And the matrix potential says water should go down downhill. And the water underneath it says, too bad, there's no more room. Uh, you just have to sit on top, wait. Um, we have a similar situation on the layer below, which is as water drains out of a soil, uh, you can't make it go negative. Uh, and furthermore, we're going to say we have this theta dry or dry soil capacity. We're going to assume that we don't go below that level. Um, so some minimum amount of moisture that's retained in the soil. And so the flux out is going to be the minimum of what our flux equation predicts and the amount of water that's left in the soil. So um, you, yeah, your, your flux equation may say, you know, two units of water is, is gonna leave this bucket. But if the bucket says, I only have one unit of water in, in me, you know, one go, is what leaves. Uh, the other bit of complexity we'll add is that it's pretty common for texture to vary uh, by soil layer. And so the parameters in your model would also need to live in a vector that would uh, tell you what parameters to use for any particular layer of the soil. So this is a illustration shows, you know, for typical soil, how you would move from, you know, uh, uh, O horizon, which is a lot of organic material on, on the top, uh, to, to, you know, weathered soils to, you know, pot potentially, you know, moving further and further down until you get to, kind of the unweathered parent material. So it's going to tend to get coarser as you go down, uh, more weathered on the top. Uh, and so the properties of the soil are going to change. It's going to be more compacted as you go down. It's going to be more aerated as you go up. So that theta sat is going to tend to go down as you go down through the soil as well. When we think about this profile of soil, there's also things we need to think about in terms of the boundary condition. So in most of these grid cells, you have soil above you and soil below you, but uh, what do you do at the bottom? So there you have choices to make and the choices you make could depend on uh, the system you're working in. And so in some systems you might have a bedrock on the bottom. And so you would say, you know, it, there's no flow. You know, the water hits there and it stops. It just piles up. Uh, it could be other systems might have, uh, you know, drainage through that bedrock into lower soil layers into, you know, the watershed. Uh, so there may be, that may be an assumption of constant flow or free drainage. So just whatever gravity says can happen, can happen, or partial drainage, which could just be something between uh, no flow and free drainage. Or you could assume that the water at the bottom is always saturated. So maybe you have some other uh, water in the system, you just assume that, uh, you know, it always stays saturated. So you have choices to make, uh, depending on the system you're working in. Uh, then you also have an upper boundary condition. This one's actually much simpler because uh, most of the time in most systems, if you're not actively irrigating them, uh, moisture is going to come in just from the top and it's going to come in from precipitation as the primary driver. And so you can think at the top of uh, water coming in, you might form a puddle. And so that puddle has some height. And so since the water in the puddle has some height, it has a gravitational uh, potential. Um, but there's nothing in that water other than water, so it does not have a matrix potential. Uh, and so it's going to, it, do, 
tend to uh, infiltrate into the soil. And the rate that that puddle, puddle drains in the soil, that infiltration rate is going to depend on the height, um, which does depend on the precipitation rate, and how much moisture is in the soil, so how much capacity it has, and, and the conductivity and matrix potential of that soil. So you have this upper boundary condition. The other thing we have to think about, which we thought about with our population model as well, is, is we need to start off somewhere. So we need some initial condition. So in the population models, we had some N0, some population at time zero. So here we need a soil moisture at time zero, uh, but we also need a soil moisture not just at one depth, but we need soil moisture is at the full profile. And depending on where you, kind of what you're doing and why you're doing this, uh, you may have good data on what the soil moisture is at any point in time, or you may not. You may uh, have to make some educated guesses at where you're starting at. And then you might have some questions about uh, how long does that matter? So you would think at some point that I, the moisture state, state of the soil shouldn't matter on about how you started it. It only has so much memory. Um, and then how sensitive are your predictions to any assumption you make about the initial conditions? Uh, thankfully, soils tend not to be chaotic like a lot of like uh, logistic growth can be, uh, but they do have memory. So there's still going to be some time that it takes for them to reach some steady state that doesn't depend. Um, so they do have that kind of the same idea of, of uh, you know, how long does it take to reach an equilibrium that we had uh, in population models. A few other things that, that you might want to think about depending on where in the world you're doing this. Uh, some systems get cold in the winter. So hydraulic conductivity is going to decrease rapidly when soils freeze because now you have solid soil, solid water, and gas, uh, or a mix of solid frozen water and, and liquid water. Um, similarly, in systems that have snow, you're going to have to model the movement of water through snow. Uh, and so water flows through snow very similar to soil. Snow has a, a hydraulic conductivity, but has additional complexity that it can melt, and be, you know, frozen snow can melt and become water uh, dynamically as well. And that definitely changes the conductivity uh, depending on whether it's a hard, hardly compact icy snow or a light fluffy snow. Uh, Likewise, when we define the properties of, of soils, we did it under this sand, silt, clay definition under the assumption they summed 100%, but a lot of soils also have a, a pretty high organic content. Um, and so organic soils are gonna have a high saturation point. They tend to be very sponge-like and holding water. Uh, they have a high matrix potential. Uh, they tend to have below average conductivity. In fact, that organic soil kind of uh, is part of what makes uh, you know a good rich soil good for plants is is kind of that high saturation, its ability to kind of hold on to moisture like a sponge, um, and you know, you know have that soil so it doesn't just drain out of the soil. Um, and then likewise, uh, other effects we haven't really dove into are things like that evaporation off the surface uh, where things like litter or mulch is going to reduce uh, the evaporation. Um, we, don't, we haven't talked about how plant uptake that transpiration would remove moisture from the soil. Uh, but you could think about how those would work. And, and ultimately, those would be flux equations as well. So you think about, say, the atmosphere, and you have some atmosphere that has some uh, moisture content, some humidity. You have some you know, humidity of the vapor in the pores mm -hmm. of the soil usually assumed to be at, at uh, 100 percent humidity and then you're going to have some conductivity be between the land and the atmosphere and that conductivity is going to depend on things like wind speed but again it's just going to be uh, flux equations um, same with plant uptake it's going to be some water potential uh, in the soil some water potential in the tree and water is going to move up the tree as it gets sucked up by the plant. Uh, finally, you can take what we've done here and in, in concept, you can very easily move it beyond a one-dimensional profile to a two or three-dimensional problem by, again, just setting up a loop uh, over uh, space. And so then you don't just have fluxes vertically, but you potentially also have fluxes laterally 
but they're driven by the same exact equations. And so that allows you to think about uh, water flow across a watershed, so watershed hydrology. Uh, what we talked about here can also be thinking about deeper uh, dynamics um, into the aquifer. You can think about contaminant spread through systems as well. So not just the flows of water, but the flows of other uh, other things through the soils with the water. And we can think about things like salt water intrusion and think about wells and pumping. And so, you know, this kind of sets you up for kind of everything that you would cover in hydrology class, but also kind of thinking about how you would implement that uh, numerically. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and uh, thanks.